hi guys and welcome back to my channel so this is jennifer from the future i'm just hopping on into this video in case any of you guys are confused about what's going on well in the beginning when i made genesis 4 the videos were extremely long probably like 110 minutes all together i had to break a lot of 39 minute videos and 20 minute videos apart just to get it down you really have to like a youtuber to watch 30 minute video honestly me i don't like watching videos it's probably over 10 minutes i'm trying to cut it down as much as i can without cutting out too much of the important messages that god wants you guys to get from this video i am sorry that i had this video postponed for so long it's just so much has been going on in my life as many youtubers know like making youtube videos is literally like another job it's so time consuming especially if you don't have the necessary devices to do so like yes it's cool to do it on your phone but i feel like it takes up a lot of time to do it on your phone and i recently just invested in a ipad air so it is way more useful than the iphone is but once again like i said i am sorry about that but thank you guys for tuning in thank you for being so 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 patient with me and without further ado let's get into the video head here so verse 6 says why are you so angry the lord asked cain why do you look so dejected you will be accepted if you do what is right but if you refuse to do what is right then watch out sin is crouching at the door eager to control you you must subdue it and be its master so god looked at uh cain and he asked him you know why are you so angry like what, what what's the problem you know, and he told them that sin is trying to control you, but you have to cast it away. You have to, you know, not give into it. Right. So God is telling them that. So let's actually go over um, what Jesus said here. You will be accepted if you do what is right. But you but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out when we mess up and we make a mistake. God still shows mercy towards us, although some of the sins we commit are very unforgivable, at least to humans in our standards you know if i kill somebody another person may not forgive me because that is just so morally wrong but god missed like moses for example he killed someone and god still forgave him for but to a human in our context then that is very unforgivable taking somebody's life you know god also reveals to us our mistakes and he shows us how to fix them correction from the lord preserves your life if you're willing to obey and not harden your heart so let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrew chapter 12, verse 6. We're bound to make mistakes. The Bible says that we're going to fall short of the glory of God. But don't just continue to live in your mistakes. Don't continue to just refuse to do what God tells you to do. So Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord disciplines, disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. So when God punishes us, it's not because he hates us. It's actually because he loves us. And the Bible said it is not god's will to have any of his children go to hell it is our actions and decisions that we make in this lifetime that puts us in hell see god says that he's not going to force us to do anything so we can never come up in with the excuse that hey god forced me to do this god forced me to do that god said this no you have free will you have good choices in life you have bad choices in life you have good consequences you have bad consequences and despite what you do right here on this earth is going to play a part in where you end up after you die and you're taken from this earth do not be fooled you cannot live a hell-bound lifestyle you cannot live live a rebellious lifestyle you cannot live a life lifestyle full of sin and wickedness and think that you have any chances of getting into heaven because the devil is a lie don't be misled don't be confused guys god's warning to cain applies to all of us god will only accept us if we obey him obeying god not only shows him who his true family is but it also shows him who truly loves him these are the main reasons why god will not force you to do anything and he grants us free will so in order to back up what I said with some scripture, let's turn in our Bibles to Mark 3, verse 35. And we're going to be using the KJV version for this. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. God says, whoever obeys his will, you are considered his family. Whoever doesn't, you're not considered his family. And to back that up with another verse, we're going to go to matthew chapter 12 verses 46 through 50 kjv version while he yet talks to the people jesus christ behold his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him then one said unto him behold thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee but he answered and said unto him that told him who is my mother and who are my brethren and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said behold my mother and my brethren 
For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Now, does he necessarily mean that Mary was in deep sin or anything like that? No, but he was actually using this as an example. For those that choose to obey God and live righteously, these are the people that I consider my family. People that do the will of God, inevitably, ultimately, God's family. So when we choose to do the wrong things, by God's standard, it's not the world. See, the world may tell us that it's wrong to go out and say that homosexuality is a sin, right? That is wrong to the world's standards. They preach that when a Christian says this, they're hateful. They preach that when a Christian says this, they're being mean. No, it's not that we're hateful, we're being mean. You guys want us to conform and you don't want to hear the truth. That is the problem. What person in their right mind wants to hear all the time that you're living a wrong lifestyle? You're not doing what God told you to do. Nobody wants to hear that. So they come up with these ludicrous statements and ideas about Christians and how we're very hateful and we're very this and that. When actuality, unlike the friends that are tolerating your sin, we're the ones that love you the most because we love you enough to tell you what you don't want to hear. We love you enough to separate ourselves from you when you're not doing right. We love you enough to hold you accountable and just always tell you that you're wrong. It is not that we hate homosexuals. God says, love what I love and hate what I hate. We hate the deeds. We hate your acts. We, I, I love every human being. I'm not around here berating homosexuals. I'm not around here spitting on them. I am not homophobic whatsoever. Homophobic people hate being around gay people, right? I don't hate being around gay people. I simply hate the deeds and the lifestyle that you guys live because it is contrary to what my father loves. You know, they're nice people. They're human just like everybody else. They're still somebody that God created at the end of the day. And for any Christian that feels justified in being rude or bullying or being mean to homosexuals, that is actually wrong. And you think that you're doing a service for God, but you're actually doing him a disservice because if another Christian or other people that don't even know God or what they wanted to give God a chance, see that what you're doing to another human being, they may walk away from God. They, you know, if that's how Christians act, I don't necessarily want to be a Christian. If y'all going to be mean to a person like that. So your entire lifestyle has to reflect God. Like I said, I don't go around hating people that are gay. And how I look at it is I have to, I put my salvation first. I have to care about my salvation first, right? Um, I'm not going to necessarily get caught up in what the next person is doing. The most that I can do is pray for them. The most that I can do is pray that God shows them the way. Show that, uh, Pray that God reveals the truth to them. Pray that one day that they truly take God seriously and they surrender the lifestyle that they're living, right? But most people won't dare say that because this world doesn't like to offend people. This world doesn't like to make people feel uncomfortable. But... God wasn't here to please you. God wasn't here to make you feel good in the midst of your sin. God was in, you know, another scripture they like to use, but God sat with the midst of sinners. Yes, God sat with them and was teaching them and was talking to them, but God was not committing sins with them. That's a big difference. But at the end of the day, you have to seek out your own soul and salvation. At the end of the day, homosexual, heterosexual, transsexual, red, blue, or green, every single one of us is going to stand before God and we're going to answer for to every Every single thing that we have ever done since he brought us into this earth so you have to care about that more than the next person like i said i love everybody but some people's deeds i hate even some of my own deeds even some of the own transgressions that i have committed i hate you know it bothers me it makes me feel lifeless when i disobey god but i don't hate anyone hate is a very strong word even if they do something that makes me uncomfortable and i know that it's not godly i do not hate them you know so it is what it is and it takes a lot of courage and guts for people to you know stand up and actually stick to the bible and say what needs to be said a lot of people will not do that because they're afraid of rejection they're afraid that they won't have any friends anymore they're afraid that people are going to mock them people are going to make fun of them people are going to say mean things about them the world is just simply going to hate them but you have to realize that god has already prepared us for this you have to realize that god has already said are you any greater than your master if they killed me will they not kill you too if they have mocked me if they spit on me if they laughed at me will they not do the same thing to you they can't get to god anymore so who do they target now god's children I'm going to be persecuted at the end of the day the same way that Jesus got persecuted. I'm going to be made fun of. I'm going to be bullied. I'm going to be looked at as an outcast. I'm going to be all these things, but God has prepared me for this. When I'm feeling lonely and when I'm feeling discouraged, I know that I could turn to him and he will fill that void for me. So God says, fear not. 
I don't fear any man, even the ones that are going to persecute me in the future. I will not fear anything. God says that they bleed the same way that I bleed. The only one that I fear and have a deep reverence and a deep fear for it is the Lord Jesus Christ because he has the power to cast my soul into hell. So that's about it. So I said when we do the wrong things by God's standard, not the world's, and I just made a big example of what the world may say is wrong, but God says, speak out, tell the truth, shame the devil. So when we do wrong things, God separates himself from us. God and sin don't mix. Lightness and darkness don't mix. Because of God's mercy and forgiveness, he gives us an opportunity to make our wrongs right. God's warning to those who live in rebellion is so simple, yet it's so detrimental for our salvation, as he said in the Bible. He said, watch out. And what's important to understand here, God is telling you that the wages of sin is death. So if you continue to live a lifestyle that is not according to the word of God, the wages of sin is death. So God goes on to tell us that sin is eager to control us. Just as a moth is drawn to a flame, so are we towards sin. So it is in our nature, and why do I say this? Because it's in our nature. Not only were we born into a world plagued with sin, but we were also born sinners ourselves. Every single one of us was bound to transgress except Jesus Christ. So scripture says, for all have sinned and come uh, short of the glory of God. And you can find this in Romans 3.23. Another reason why we are drawn to sin is because our flesh, this, our heart, our flesh, our minds, whatever, it sides with the devil. It will always oppose God. So if God tells me, hey, Jennifer, I want you to stop fornicating, immediately my heart is going to tell me that I should fornicate, right? It's going to tell me that fornication is what I should do. So the Bible also tells you that your heart is wicked amongst all things. So it's going to immediately go against what God tells you to do. Another reason we're drawn to it is because our flesh sides with the devil. It will always oppose God. For this reason alone, we are commanded. We are commanded, children of God. We are obligated, children of God. We are told, children of God. To walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Walking in the spirit is walking in, in truth. It's walking with the spirit of God. Walking in the flesh, you're walking, you're distracted, you're walking with the devil, you're walking in darkness, you're disobeying God, you're living in rebellion. Those are two different things. Do not get them confused. Sinning, however, is a choice. Before I sat there and fornicated with who I fornicated with, I made that choice in my heart before I committed the deed. That was a choice that I made. I wasn't forced to do that. Now, rape is something which I'm not talking about that, but that is a choice. Willingly sinning is a choice. I'm not talking about things that happened to you that was beyond your control. I said, yes, we will make mistakes, but now that Jesus has defeated Satan on the cross, sin and death no longer has power over us jesus disarmed satan's power he had on us on the cross as well as his accusation that we are all evil and should perish with him but god says otherwise yes they make mistakes we do commit evil things but god knows his children those are the people that are in heaven today um those are the people that will be in heaven in the future and god knows the children that are of the devil if you live for god and with him you should never die God says that I'm a God of the living. I'm not a God of the dead. Just because we die physically, our bodies goes back to the ground from the dusty cane. Just because our body dies, which is temporary, it's not going to be here forever. Where will your soul be? If you go to heaven, you shall live. See, we think that us on this earth is living. This is not the definition of living. We won't truly live until we're in heaven with God. We're merely just existing, you know. But even still, if you're living a lifestyle right now that's righteous, then you're actually living better than the people right now that's living a lifestyle that is of the devil. They're just merely existing. What we see now from an earthly viewpoint, this is not necessarily living. And they also talk about, um, as we go deeper into the Bible, it differentiates um, certain characteristics that you'll see in heaven. God goes into it a little bit in certain characteristics that, you know, how heaven and earth are two different things. You know, you won't, we cry and we do this and the Bible says when you go to heaven, you'll never cry again. You'll never be hungry again. You'll never be thirsty again. But these are some things that we have to endure right now while we're still on earth. So it's very informative. We're no longer chained and bound to sin and death. Jesus' crucifixion and victory over Satan was foreshadowed in Genesis 3, which I hope you guys already read, where God spoke to Satan through the snake and told him that the woman's offspring will crush his head. That offspring that the Lord was talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years before Jesus even stepped on the scene was 
Jesus. That was the offspring he was speaking about, right? And God calls for us to subdue sin. So how do we go about doing this? You subdue it by resisting it, rebuking it, using God's word to combat it. So let's continue with the last few verses. And we're on verse eight right now. So one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Let's talk about verse eight quickly. Every action we make starts in the mind. Then that thought is brought into fruition by what we say or the things that we do. However, God warns us that us even thinking about evil and not rebuking it means we have transgressed in our heart, even if we didn't physically commit the act. And to back this up with scripture, we're going to go to Matthew verse five. I mean, chapter five, verse 28. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that's an example I use. So if I look at a man and I say, ooh, you know, he's so fine, I want to sleep with him. I don't necessarily have to sleep with him. I've already committed the deed in my heart. I don't have to physically go out and act. So it's very important that your thoughts are in alignment with Christ, that your thoughts have to be holy. Your thoughts have to be godly. We are commanded to cast away every wicked and high thought that exalts itself. Verse 9 says, afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? right and Cain responded I don't know am I my brother's guardian but the Lord said what have you done now let's stop right there let's go over verse three uh, verse nine I'm sorry so what I put here God asked him a question that he already knew the answer to you're gonna see that in the Bible God may ask us questions that he already know the answer to I don't necessarily understand why he do it to me. I feel like God asked you those questions to see what type of heart you have. Are you going to lie or are you going to tell the truth? So um, I highlighted what I highlighted, which is very important here. I said these are the three O's of God. God is omniscient, which is all knowing. God is omnipresent, which is he's in all places at all times. And God is also omnipotent, which means he's all powerful. Those are the three O's of God, right? So when he asked Cain, where's your brother? God already knew what Abel was. God already knew what Cain had did to Abel. Don't get it confused. God is not dumb. God don't have to come to humans and ask us questions because he knows the answer to it already. We can't hide from God, nor can we hide our sin from God. So be smart when you're responding to the Lord. If God is asking you a question 10 times out of 10, because if I say nine times out of 10, does that one percentage is a possibility that God doesn't know anything. No. So 10 times out of 10, it isn't due to him not knowing. He knows all things. How you choose to respond to his question, either with the truth or a lie, is what's really important. So let's move on to verse 10. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crop for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Then the Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So let's go over those verses a bit. And every time a person is wrongfully murdered, as God said, their blood cries out to God from the ground. The reason why I say wrongfully murdered is because... I wanted to differentiate that between God actually commanding somebody to go out and murder this person. Because back then, I looked at God like he was really a man of war. Like he wanted this person to go out and fight this army. He wanted this person to do that. So let's say that this man raped a 12-year-old girl, right? He went to prison and a man raped him, but the man brutally raped him so bad that he died. Was that necessarily wrongfully killing him or was that God's vengeance? Was that God avenging that person, avenging that 12 year old daughter? This is why God also says vengeance is mine. So things like that, I tend to think about. Now, I feel like every murder that was committed was either from a person reaping what they have sown and some murders were wrong. And God has avenged that person by allowing something sevenfold to happen bad to that person. So let's go into depth about it a little bit. Every time a person is wrongfully murdered, their, bri their blood cries out to God from the ground. Should justice not be served? And these are questions that I'm asking. Should someone not advocate for their souls, those lost souls, the souls that were here and they were, wrong they were wrongfully taken from this earth? 
I said, there is an advocate. There is somebody to advocate for them. And that man is Jesus Christ. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God will avenge everyone who is and was done wrong. It is not for us to take matters into our own hands. Did God not avenge Abel? I feel like he did, he very much did. He didn't let the deed, the wickedness that, uh, that Cain committed to go unpunished. Cain was indeed punished. Now Adam or Eve, and this is a thought, food for thought, could have been mad at uh, Cain and they could have decided to kill Cain because of what he did to Abel. Payback, right? No, never fight fire with fire. I also go on to say that let go and let God, and I actually highlighted that right there. Let go and let God. So I'm not telling you to forget what happened to you. If it's something traumatic, you will always remember that. But I'm telling you to put it in God's hand, give it to God because as a human being, we're not gonna always make the smartest or the most wise decisions when it comes to a person hurting us. Remember that we will reap what we have sown. So let God take care of it because if I go and I murder the man that took advantage of my daughter, I'm now guilty. I'm now in the wrong. If someone may, re I, I'm gonna read what I sow. Someone may do the same thing to me. So why do God choose to avenge us? And he says, not for y'all to seek vengeance. Because whenever God acts, it's never sinful. When God avenges a person, it is very much justified. It is very much, it, it needed to happen, right? Everything that God do, does is never anything evil inside of it. Rather as humans, when we avenge people, nine times out of 10, we want to do some evil to them. We want to do some wickedness to them. We want to hurt them, right? When humans act most times out of anger or hurt, we pay them back with evil. See, we want to do evil to people that do evil to us. And that's not how God ordained it to be. This is why God says vengeance is mine. Don't take matters into your own hands because now you're not going to be found blameless. Now I have to punish you the same way that you felt you had to punish them. So it's a cycle. We want to hurt those who hurt us. In other words, hurt people, hurt other people. Being the bigger person is easier said than done, but it's important so that you could be found blameless and be in good standing with our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna ask the viewer who's viewing this question. If someone were to molest, if someone were to rape, if someone were to take advantage of your child or someone that you may be very close to, who would have strength in the faith to not retaliate? So answer that in the comment section below. Would you have faith to not act upon what that person did to someone that you cared about or would you just willingly just be like yeah i'm gonna give it to god i'm sorry that happened to my daughter but it is what it is i can't do nothing about it i'm sorry i have to give it to god who would let god be in full control of that situation would you let god be in full control or would you let him be in partial control lord i'm gonna go find this man and i'm gonna spit on him i'm going to degrade him but at the end of the day i want you to fully punish him because i can't do it how i want to do it or would you just take full control you don't want god to control it at all if you admit that you wouldn't sit back and trust in God and do nothing, then continue to pray that God builds your faith. Continue to pray that your faith is built by trusting more and more and more in Christ, that he's going to avenge you. Everything is gonna be okay. Things that are outside of our control, God is taking care of it. We don't have to be in control of all things. Bad things that have happened to us in this lifetime, God is taking control of it. You may feel like he's taking a long time, but God is right on time. How did God still show mercy towards Cain after he killed Abel? So although none of us deserves God's mercy, what would we be without it? We'll all be in hell. That's, that's, that's the answer to the question. We'll all be in hell. He still allowed Cain to live after he did something so horrendous. Yes, God still punished him, but he could have taken him from the earth. God could have just like, okay, let me open up a hole, swallow you in the earth. He could have been punished that way. God could have consumed him with fire. God could have had fire come down like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. So... I feel like look at God as up a wild card. When you do something bad, you never know what type of punishment God has in store for you. So I feel like don't even test God like that. For 24, I said every man will reap what he have sown. So think of sin as more of a domino effect. I told you sin is like a cycle. If it isn't dealt with, because sin is very contagious, it will continue to spread and may cause many to fall. And most times when you do evil to a person, it is returned to you way worse than the deed that you committed to them. Just to end it off, the birth of Seth, Adam had sexual relations with his wife again and she gave birth to another son. She named him Seth for, she said, God has granted me another son in place of Abel whom Cain killed. When Seth grew up, he had a son and named him Enosh. At, this, at that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. 
So I feel like this Bible study was very informative. I really, really, really liked it. Um, there's still a lot of questions that I personally will go to God in prayer about that. Um, I pray that he reveals the answer to me. If not, that's okay too. And maybe you guys will like to do the same thing. So with the last bit of time we have, let's just go ahead and pray out. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the amazing Bible study. It was so enlightening. It was so inspiring. It was so refreshing. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come in fellowship with each other. Thank you for allowing your words to touch our hearts, Lord. We ask that you engrave your words on our heart. You say, give us this day our daily bread. The, that bread that you speak of is the word. And the, you also say to get it daily, which means this is something that we have to do every single day, Lord. I ask that you don't allow Satan to snatch your words from our heart, Lord. We ask that your word continues to shape us, mold us, and transform us. We ask that once again, we be doers just as well as hearers. We be hearers just as well as doers of the word, Lord. We ask that we apply your words to our everyday lives, Lord. We ask that we trust in you to fully walk in obedience and in, and in truth, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all things that you have done in the past, you're doing now, and you will do in the future, Lord. Just thank you. I feel like even me saying thank you is not enough, Lord. But even with our thank yous, we want our actions to show that we don't take you for granted. We want our actions to show that we are grateful for you. We want our actions to show that we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So thank you guys for doing this Bible study with me. It was an amazing time. I feel so good that I was able to get back on YouTube and spread the word of God. I do plan on uploading new Bible content or book content every Friday. I want to try to make it a habit of doing it every Friday instead of just uploading randomly. But it gives me time to edit. That gives me time to perfect the videos of how I want to perfect them. So I'm very excited. Um, you know, and I thank Jesus for you guys. I thank Jesus that he allowed you to stumble upon this video um, so that the truth can be revealed to you, so that you can learn more, so that you can fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you. God loves you. You know, stay blessed and stay encouraged. Bye.